Hey there, Micro Church. Hope you're doing great and had an amazing uh, Christmas this year. And as we're heading into the new year and looking ahead and what God is doing and what God has done, I want us to take a, uh, some time and, and focus on the Gospel of Mark. Right, so we're going to start a new series this week, and we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark and what this Gospel teaches us about who Jesus is and what Jesus does. You see, Mark does a, an amazing job throughout his Gospel, continually bringing us, bringing us in front of the person of Jesus Christ and, and who he is and what he does. That's Mark's whole point. He wants us to see Jesus. Uh, in fact, one of the coolest things about Mark is Mark is actually one of the most interpreted books in all of the world, if not the most interpreted book in all of the world because it's so short and concise. But yet, Mark also wrote this gospel for for Gentiles. He wrote it for non-Jewish people, uh, people that didn't really understand Jewish customs or anything like that. And so he wrote it for uh, the world outside of Israel to hear and to respond to the person and to the work and to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And so in Mark chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 8 today, and we're going to look at those. And we're going to see that everything that we know, right, and everything that we believe as Christians, as followers of Christ, is rooted in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. So Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 1, uh, going through verse 8, says, "...the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all of the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan. And they were confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and he wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts, and he ate wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. All right, so Mark begins this gospel a little differently than all the other gospels. Uh, he, he doesn't begin it like Matthew and Luke do with this genealogy of Jesus and laying out Jesus' lineage. Instead, Mark begins with a declaration of who Jesus Christ is, of his true identity. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right? These 12 words that Mark begins his gospel with, are, they're, they're actually extremely divisive words if you think about it. They divide humanity into two groups, uh, those who believe that these words are true and those who don't. Right? Those who believe uh, that these words literally change everything and those who believe they're just mere words or that we're delusional uh, for believing them. But Mark uh, not only does an incredible job laying out for us who Jesus is and declaring who Jesus is in this statement, uh, he actually helps us understand who he is. And he does this by alluding to the beginning of the Bible. He says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love what Paul David Tripp said about this. He said, it's almost like Mark is saying, what I'm about to tell you and the person I'm about to introduce you to has a fundamental and seismic implications as the creation of the world did. So in other words, right, Jesus coming into the world is just as important as the beginning of the world. And it's important because his, his coming into the world is God's way of restoring this world. Right, and, and all that is in it back into himself, back into a relationship with him. Is God dealing with our greatest needs, which is the forgiveness of our sins and the healing of our brokenness. And so Mark, right from the very beginning of his gospel, he's laying out this good news, right, that God does this, that God does this work. He restores our lives through the person of Jesus Christ. Listen, this is good news, right? This is the gospel that God does his good work through Jesus Christ. But Mark also makes sure to let his readers know that this good news, this gospel, that it's about Jesus Christ. It is 
Jesus Christ. See, that word Christ is it's the same word as Messiah, uh, the anointed one, the anointed one, the one out, the one that all of Israel was waiting to come and, and to rescue them. But what Mark is letting his readers know or letting them in on is that this news, right, this good news wasn't just good news for the nation of Israel, right? This good news was for the whole world, right? It was it was for all of us. Mark was pointing out in these words by alluding to the beginning, right, the beginning of all of creation, that Jesus wasn't just the hope for Israel. He wasn't just the hope for the Hebraic nation, that he's the hope for all humanity. He is the hope for the entire world. Here's the thing. Jesus Christ is our only hope. No presidential candidate, no Supreme Court justice, no senator, no celebrity, no boyfriend, no girlfriend, no husband, no wife, no one, no person other than Jesus Christ is our hope. And unless we believe this to be true, right, we will always be let down time and time and time again by the person or by the people that we place our hope or our trust in. But hear me on this. Jesus never fails us. He will never let us down. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. He is our only hope. Mark goes on to fully identify Jesus Christ as the Son of God in this passage, right? These three words, Son of God, they declare that Jesus Christ was both fully man and fully God, right? That he's the creator of all things, the sovereign one, the almighty God living as Emmanuel, God with us. But not only living as God with us, right? He is living with us in the same form, in the same fashion that we live. He took on our humanness. He took on our humanity, right? And with weakness and with ailments and with pains and with feelings and with thoughts, just like we have and just like we suffer from. The writer of Hebrews, I love what what he wrote. He said, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one right who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So this declaration of Jesus Christ, right, the Son of God, is at the center of our faith. Right? It's the realization that God came in the form of man and lived a perfect life and died a sinner's death, so that we can receive His forgiveness and His righteousness, so that we can be restored into a right relationship with Him. So as you see, these these words in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, they either life-changing or they're ridiculous and delusional. We either believe them or we don't. They either give us hope or they don't, right? They give us hope because they reveal to us that God's answer to the problems of this world are not wrapped up in the principles or the philosophies or even the moral codes that we try to live by, but that his answer to our greatest problems and his answer to our greatest needs truly is himself. It truly is Jesus Christ. See, after Mark introduces us to the person of Jesus Christ, he begins to introduce us to the next person, and we'll talk about that next week. But here's what I want you to think about as you uh, think about these 12 words that we just went over today, okay? How are you going to respond? How are you going to respond to these 12 words? Are you going to believe that they are true and that they literally change everything? Or are you going to believe that we're just disillusioned by them and they amount to nothing? How will you respond to these 12 words, to the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life today.